Okay, well, welcome again, everyone. It's so nice to see all your wonderful, beautiful faces here. My name's Naomi Hoffer. I work as a program manager at the Cancer Resource Center. We're part of the Helen Diller Family Comprehensive Cancer Center, and we're actually located right below this auditorium on the first floor. And our mission is really um, to support whole person care outside the clinic. We know that most people come to UCSF because of the reputation of the excellent physicians that we have, the researchers, the skilled technicians. But I think everyone in this room and thousands of other people know that um, cancer is, you know, healing from cancer is more than just about getting the cancer cells out of your body. You know, it's, we're whole people and we're whole people that are affected by cancer. So um, we are really in the business of supporting the whole person in other ways. And so we work a lot with the Osher Center for Integrative Medicine and wonderful people like Dr. Donald Abrams. And we do a number of programs that I just want to mention a few of them. Um, they're all, if you're on our mailing list, uh, you'll, you'll see them in our programs that we put out. We really look at uh, healing the person in five different areas, really through our programs and, and services. Um, the first is in nutrition. We want to support you in learning about nutrition, and we're going to learn a lot about that here from Dr. Abrams tonight. Uh, but we also have nutrition counseling. We have nutrition seminars. And we just really want to support you in learning about the nutrients that your body needs for, uh, for health and healing. And the other area that we look at, the second area is really exercise and movement and supporting you um, in moving. I mean, we're bodies that are made to move. So uh, we provide exercise counseling for our patients. We also do a number of exercise classes and movement classes with, uh, in conjunction with the Osher Center for Integrative Medicine. We, we use their space. Uh, the third area for a healing that we really want to support in our programming is in stress management. And we do that through weekly meditation classes. The psycho-oncology has ongoing stress management courses. Um, we, the Osher Center for Integrative Medicine does ongoing uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction classes. So, um, you know, stress management is really just to help, you know, you separate yourself from your thoughts, not burden your body with all the stress that we put on it in our daily lives. So helping you do that. Um, the other area that we, we support you in is in social connections, helping you connect with other people um, through support groups, through peer support, um, through many other programs that allow you to come together and get to know one another and share and bond and feel um, connected. And then finally, we support you through information. You know, it can be overwhelming to have the number of, you know, websites and information that's out there regarding health and healing and treatment and disease. So we have put together these health information sheets that try to get the very best type of information that's credible, that's evidence-based, um, that's vetted, so that you're not as overwhelmed um, in finding your own health information. And we do events like this as well with Dr. Abrams. So if you are interested in learning about all that we have, uh, please be on our mailing list. And um, I'm now going to <laughs> introduce, uh, while you're all here today, Dr. Donald Abrams. One thing I just want to mention, we are going to hold questions till the end. We're going to have mics for you. This is going to be recorded. And uh, so just f if you could... When you raise your hand for questions, we're going to hand you a mic. And if you could wait to ask your questions until you get the mic. Um, the other thing is, please be mindful of your questions. Uh, Donald is not able to you know, offer you medical advice or offer individual consultations. So please, if you could, try to keep your questions kind of more general, of general interest to all of us here in this room. That way we can all get the most out of our time with Dr. Abrams. So I'm thrilled and very honored to have Dr. Abrams here with us tonight. Donald Abrams is a professor of clinical medicine at UCSF and chief of hematology oncology at the San Francisco General Hospital. He is co-chair of the UCSF Helen Diller Family Comprehensive Cancer Center's developing program in support of care. He served as an assistant director of the UCSF Positive Health Program at San Francisco General Hospital and has conducted numerous clinical trials investigating complementary therapies in patients with HIV, including therapeutic touch, traditional Chinese medicine, 
medical marijuana, medicinal mushrooms, and distance healing. Since completing his fellowship in integrative medicine at the University of Arizona, Dr. Abrams has been providing integrative medicine consultation to people living with and beyond cancer at the UCSF Osher Center for Integrative Medicine. He remains interested in conducting clinical trials in integrative oncology, particularly investigating medicinal mushrooms, traditional Chinese medicine interventions, and massage. He has co-edited an Oxford University Press textbook. I'm just going to show you here. It's a wonderful thick book <laughs> in integrative oncology with Andrew Weil. And he was also named top doctor in Newsweek's special health issue on curing cancer in the category of medical oncology. He is a wonderful human being. He's very generous with his time, with his knowledge, and um, cares about his patients, cares about this topic, and really walks his talk. <laughs> so please help me in welcoming Dr. Donald Abrams. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So, yeah, so I didn't do slides tonight. I thought I would just come and wrap and talk about what it is that I do and what is integrative oncology and how I got here in my journey in my life. So at the beginning when I was training here at UCSF to become an oncologist, suddenly AIDS came out of the blue and we didn't know what it was or what to do about it. So I became a champion of alternative therapies even when there was no conventional therapy to be alternative to. And then when we got conventional therapy, I said, oh, this isn't very good, AZT, many of you might remember that. And so I wrote all the chapters in all the AIDS textbooks about complementary and alternative therapies. Then in 1992, somebody challenged me to study cannabis, marijuana, as a treatment for patients with the AIDS wasting syndrome. So I said, okay, I can do that. I went to college in the 60s. So I fought the government for a few years and ultimately won and got a million dollars and 1,400 of their best cannabis cigarettes. And I started to do research, which gave me a strong appreciation of the power of plants as medicine, which then took me to the Telluride Mushroom Festival in Telluride, Colorado, a month after I had done my first ever jury duty and came home and said, I want to go to law school. But in Telluride, I met Andrew Weil, the guy with the white beard, looks like Santa Claus, the guru of integrative medicine. And he described a two-year online distance learning fellowship you could do with his program in integrative medicine at the University of Arizona. So I said, aha, uh -huh, I don't want to go to law school. I want to do that. And I did, and it changed my life. When I finished in 2004, I said, I'm done with HIV AIDS. I've done that for 25 years, and it's quite different from when I started. What I want to do now is integrative oncology working with people living with and beyond cancer and helping them to integrate these other modalities, basically the ones that Natalie mentioned, nutrition, physical activity, stress reduction, mindfulness, Chinese medicine, um, into their conventional care. Can't really do that at San Francisco General, where, again, I've been chief of oncology, uh, and I've worked for 33 years, because, as I often say, for most of my patients there, cancer is actually the least of their problems sometimes. They're homeless, they're addicted, they have mental health issues, or they're undocumented, so I can't really talk to them about eating organic or doing yoga because they have much more basic needs. So I came here to the Osher Center across the street where I'm not actually treating cancer, I'm treating people living with cancer, sort of in that holistic fashion that was just mentioned by Naomi. And and I often tell my patients there who are being treated by another oncologist that cancer is like a weed and somebody else is taking care of the weed and it's my job to work with the garden and make the soil as inhospitable as possible to growth and spread of the weed. So that's what I do is really not work on focusing the cancer, on the cancer but on the patient. And what I talk about I find really are things that the patient can do themselves. And that is empowering. Because I think if you hear a diagnosis, you have cancer, suddenly the rug is pulled from underneath you. And you feel like you've lost your locus of control. And you're now at the mercy of the surgeon, the radiation oncologist, the medical oncologist, even the chemotherapy nurse. And what I do is try to return some control by talking about things that everybody has 
control over themselves. And number one, how are you fertilizing the garden? What are you eating? I mean, even the Journal of the American Medical Association uh, came out with a report on the health of the United States, 1990 to 2010. And the single most common cause now of morbidity and mortality in the United States is dietary issues. And that doesn't include obesity, which is number four, or physical inactivity, which is number five. And dietary issues is basically the so-called standard American diet, SAD, abbreviated appropriately because it is. We need to eat right. And especially cancer. You know, people always think, well, it, I got cancer because it's in my genes. That's not true. Only 5% of cancer is from genes. Probably 30% of cancer, the same amount that's related to tobacco, is related to diet, what we eat and what we don't eat. Let me just put in a word for people's oncologists, because oncology, you know, is an amazingly exploding field. There's so much new information. Everybody has to be a specialist. Left breast, right kidney. You know, nobody really treats all cancers because there's so much information, there's so many new drugs, and we're doing such a great job in prolonging survival. So when you go to your regular oncologist and say, what should I eat? They're going to tell you, it doesn't really matter. Eat whatever you want. I mean, people come to me very frustrated. Why did they say that? And I say, well, this is sort of another specialty, if you will, and people can't really keep up with it, or maybe they don't believe it. Maybe they believe that really what you eat is not going to make a difference. I think there's good evidence from clinical trials, you know, which is our gold standard in oncology, that people particularly with stage three colon cancer is what it was most studied in, people who eat correctly don't eat a standard American diet but eat a more prudent diet. People who are more physically active do better. In fact, they do almost as good as if they, when they get their chemotherapy after the surgery. So lifestyle changes are important, useful, and have an impact. And again, there's something that the patient themselves has control over and can decide to do. So I was asked to speak at Muni, of all places, and that's what your handout is. I was asked to talk about healthful eating to protect against cancer, but it's the same. The, what I talk about when I uh, meet with patients or when I lecture about nutrition and cancer are the guidelines from the American Institute for Cancer Research, the World Cancer Research Fund. And they have 10 simple guidelines. And number 10 says, for cancer survivors, follow the nine guidelines above. So why don't we start at the top? Number one is to be as lean as possible without being underweight. Now, why is that? We have an epidemic of overweight and obesity in the United States. Two-thirds of the nation is either overweight or obese. Body mass index over 25. What does that mean? So how does that relate to cancer? Well, it's felt that 115,000 cancer deaths a year are attributed to the cancers that are related to being obese. How does obesity cause cancer? Well, fat, first of all, makes hormones, particularly estrogen. And women with estrogen receptor positive breast cancer or uterine cancer, those are two of the most common hormones that are related to being, most common uh, cancers related to being overweight. The other cancers that we know are pretty much related to obesity are esophagus, stomach, colon, gallbladder, and for some reason kidney is too. So those are a lot of different cancers that are related to uh, obesity that are not necessarily hormone-driven. So fat also makes other chemicals called cytokines that produce inflammation and suppress immunity. So those are three ways now, uh, hormones, inflammation, and decreased immunity. I think the most important reason that obese people uh, are at greater risk for cancer is because 
when you're obese, your body is not sensitive to the insulin that you produce to manage your sugar in your bloodstream. So you produce more insulin, an insulin-like growth factor. Both of those promote inflammation in the body. And the growth factor is also a growth factor for cancer. So being more sensitive to insulin by being not overweight is, again, something that's good. And it's what puts people who are overweight at greater risk for cancer. So be as lean as possible without being underweight. Being underweight is not good because, you know, as they tell you when you go through chemotherapy, you, need, you can't lose any more weight. Oncologists, as a rule, get very nervous when a patient loses weight because we think the cancer is getting the upper hand. But I tell my patients, if you're losing weight intentionally, tell your oncologist you're losing weight intentionally. The second guideline says be physically active for 30 minutes each day. How many people do that? Pretty good. This is a good crowd. <laughs> there are just <clears throat> two articles were recently published on the impact of physical activity in decreasing the risk of 13 different types of cancer. Very impressive. Being physically active, again, keeps you from being obese and also changes your hormone levels so that that estrogen drive that drives estrogen receptor positive breast cancer and uterine cancer is diminished. There, for some reason, one of those articles suggested that high activity physical activity levels puts people at increased risk for melanoma, which makes a little sense because maybe people are doing physical activity out in the sun. And the other one that was a slightly increased risk was prostate cancer for reasons that don't seem clear. But physical activity, very important. I refer my patients to the program here at the Cancer Center to get the free exercise uh, counseling session with the personal trainer. They love it. Uh, you know, the trainer takes into account lymphedema or broken bones or whatever so that they, each participant gets a streamlined uh, recommendation for physical activity. I think physical activity needs to be aerobic so that your heart beats and you sweat. When my patients say, how do I detoxify from chemo? I say, sweat. Exercise, do saunas, get it out. Sweat. Uh, but I think we also always need to do resistance exercise to keep our muscles toned and our bones mineralized. So many cancers go to bone. I think bone should be strong so that it could withstand an attack by metastases. I personally discovered yoga six years ago. It's messing up some of my joints a little bit, but I really love it. I became sort of addicted because it's about balance, flexibility, strength, and also there's that mind-body component where you're moving with your breath. I always say Jewish boys can't meditate, but at the end of Shivasana, the corpse pose at the end of a yoga session, when they say, you can come back now, I actually feel like I've been someplace. Because your mind is just moving with your breath and your movement, and you're not thinking about everything else. And so I really highly recommend yoga, Tai Chi, is also a good intervention. I, I took classes uh, with one of my colleagues at the Osher Center when he was teaching Tai Chi. For me, it was less, uh, was a little more balletic and more fluid and less uh, athletic for me than yoga because I do my yoga at the gym, not in some spiritual center. So, so I think uh, yoga or Tai Chi are very good because they have that component of mind-body as well. The number three guideline says uh, avoid sugary drinks. Now, when they first, they publish these guidelines every 10 years. And in 2007, which was the last time they did the guidelines, uh, it used to say uh, avoid energy-dense foods, including those with refined sugar and fats. And then the bottom line was avoid sugary drinks. But they changed that in 2007 to avoid sugary drinks with the other part underneath. And I was at the meeting in Washington when they changed it. So I went to the microphone and I said, there are sugary drinks and there are sugary drinks. You can drink a cola beverage, God forbid, or a fruit punch, which is probably glucose and high fructose corn syrup, 
or you can squeeze three oranges in the morning. And the response from the podium was, energetically, they're all the same. Because if you eat an orange, the fiber slows down the absorption of sugar into the bloodstream. If you squeeze the sugar away from the fiber, it's like drinking a Coca-Cola. So why is that bad? When the body sees that sugar, it responds with insulin, an insulin-like growth factor. I mentioned just previously that both of those are increasing inflammation and the growth factor increases tumor cells. In fact, this is so important in some cancers, particularly estrogen receptor positive breast cancer in women, that we're looking at blocking the insulin-like growth factor one receptor as a treatment for cancer. So does it mean I don't squeeze my three oranges every morning? I used to do it every morning. Now I just do it twice a week. When I see patients who tell me I juice everything, I don't think it's a good idea. Smoothies, I don't do smoothies, but my patients say the fiber is still there in the liquid. Somebody needs to bring me a smoothie someday so I can see how much fiber there is. There's also a concern that when you polarize the, the foods, you're actually destroying some of the nutrients that you're trying to get more of by making the juice. So I'm a big fan of whole foods. My general diet that I recommend is organic, plant-based, antioxidant-rich, anti-inflammatory whole foods. Whole foods as opposed to juicing everything or sprinkling broccoli powder in a smoothie. People say, well, what about vegetable juices? Yeah, most people put an apple or something else into their vegetable juice, so you do get that spurt of, of sugar. So uh, the fourth guideline says eat more of a variety of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes. And again, when I tell people that they should eat a plant-based diet, it's because plants are a better source of antioxidants than animal products. Oxygen, you know, lives as two molecules linked together. That's what we breathe. That's how we live. But when those oxygen molecules separate, they create so-called free radicals or reactive oxygen species, which knock into our DNA, causing damage, leading to aging or cancer. Antioxidants take those free radicals out of circulation so they don't do damage. And it turns out most foods that are rich in antioxidants are plants. Animal products are not a great source of antioxidants. That's why I say the diet should be plant-based. I don't think people need to be vegetarian or vegan or raw, but people should eat five to nine servings, that being a serving of fruits and vegetables each day, more vegetables than fruits. And since nobody understands what this means, we now say at least two and a half cups of fruits and vegetables each day, more vegetables than fruits. And they should all be, in my opinion, organic. And that's not just to avoid herbicides, pesticides, and fertilizers, which are chemicals that we don't really need in our body. It's because a plant that's grown outdoors organically needs to fight to protect itself from other plants, birds, and insects, and the sunshine. And the only way a plant knows how to protect itself is by making chemicals. Turns out those chemicals that the plant makes, the so-called phytoalexins, are the phytonutrients that benefit us. So if we're going to let food be our medicine and medicine be our food, organic is more potent than conventional. How many people try to shop organic? Well, <coughs> this audience is the converted. I mean, it is more expensive, but we deserve it. So honing down on the vegetables, my favorite are the cruciferous. Flowers grow in the shape of a crucifix. So broccoli, cauliflower, and Brussels sprouts jump to mind. But there are also cruciferous roots and green leafies that are cruciferous. Cabbage, kale, collard greens, bok choy, arugula. These contain two different groups of chemicals that are really important. One, the sulforaphanes, indole-3-carbonyl, are so potent at reducing the risk of cancer that we're now looking at it as chemotherapy, particularly in men with prostate cancer. I say eat more broccoli. In fact, if we have to eat five to nine servings of fruits and vegetables each day, I think the American thing is we eat fruit for breakfast, I eat vegetables for breakfast. 
My one breakfast is broccoli, tofu, and rice. And my other is mochi, which is pounded rice that I puff up. And I smear almond butter on it and put a sweet potato on it. Because orange-yellow vegetables are also good for you. But let me go back to the cruciferous vegetables. The other important thing in cruciferous vegetables is something called DIM, methylamine, which changes a woman's estrogen from the type that fuels estrogen receptor positive breast cancer to the type that doesn't. So cruciferous vegetables have those two things, and both of those are available in health food stores as capsules. I say eat the whole food. I believe a little bit in Paracelsus, who was an alchemist who spanned alchemy and medicine in the Renaissance. And he said there's poison in everything. The difference between a remedy and a poison is the dose. I know that I'm safe eating my broccoli in the morning for breakfast. I don't know the long-term effects of taking a pill rich in indole 3 carbonyl every day. And a good example of that is green tea, which I drink five cups of every day. They now make green tea extract capsules, or ECGC, which is the active chemical in green tea. And people who take those capsules on an empty stomach have actually damaged their liver. So again, I don't believe in taking too many of these nutrients in capsule form. I say eat the whole food. Orange yellow vegetables, I mentioned sweet potatoes, squash, carrots. Those are all very good for you. I mentioned tofu. How many people are afraid of soy? <laughs> yeah, I mean, especially women with breast cancer or at risk for breast cancer are nervous about soy because it's a plant estrogen. Well, soy actually, Asians who live in Asia and eat an Asian diet have lower rates of breast and prostate cancer because they eat soy during adolescence and puberty. The estrogenic effect of soy is not enough to overcome a woman's own estrogen, even if she's postmenopausal. And studies have shown that women with estrogen receptor positive breast cancer eating soy, whole soy foods, one portion a day actually have a decreased risk of recurrence. That was a big study done at Kaiser and also reproduced in Shanghai. So when I say a serving of a whole soy food, I mean soybean, soy milk, tofu, tempeh, and miso, and not soy cheese, soy turkey, and soy hot dogs, because those are just heavily processed foods. I mentioned rice. Brown rice is better than white rice. But if you like white rice, jasmine and basmati are better alternatives than Uncle Ben's sushi rice or standard Chinese white rice. Millet and quinoa are also good grains. Bread should be whole grain and not whole wheat. Season with ginger, garlic, onions, and turmeric. How many people know about turmeric? Very potent anti-cancer spice. How did we decide that? People looked at India, which is huge, and they have a very low rate of cancer and dementia. And honing down on what it might be, particularly Bhagwal Agarwat, who's at uh, MD Anderson, decided that turmeric is a potent anti-inflammatory and anti-cancer agent. Actually, the first I heard about turmeric was at our conventional cancer meeting, the American Society of Clinical Oncology. Investigators at Ohio State University have a mouse model of colon cancer where the mice are genetically programmed to develop colon cancer. If they fed them a turmeric enriched diet, not only did they not develop colon cancer, but they survived longer than the control animals. And that's because turmeric generally stays in the gastrointestinal tract. So it does its chemo protection work locally. If you wanna get turmeric into the bloodstream for a systemic anti-inflammatory effect, needs to be taken with black pepper or a black pepper substance called piperine. But if you're taking other uh, pharmaceutical agents, you have to be careful if you're taking turmeric and black pepper together because it also increases the absorption of everything else in the stomach significantly. And I know that personally firsthand experience because I had lowered my blood pressure from one of my prostate medicines when I started taking turmeric and black pepper uh, for my arthritis. It made the arthritis go away quickly, but I woke up every night with a headache, and it was because my 
alpha blocker was being increased in absorption. The Mediterranean spices are also good, basil, thyme, rosemary, and oregano. Fruit should be heavily pigmented, so the berries are all lovely in season right now. They must be organic because they're sponges for toxins. When they're out of season, frozen, they only lose 10% of their nutritional value, unlike vegetables, which lose a lot more of their potency when they're frozen. I don't believe much in homeopathy, but I do eat my whole apple every day, except for the stem. People coming up in the elevator with me might have noticed that I was eating right through the seeds. I think the way we eat apple, like corn on the cob, is backwards. You take it from the stem and you eat from the bottom up. Again, in homeopathy, they say take a little bit every day of what you're trying to avoid. And apple seeds are cyanide, which is death. And the queen mum ate her whole apple every day and lived to be 103. I don't think ancient men threw out their apple core or their pear core. Similarly, if you can find grapes that have seeds, you know the bitterness in that grape seed? That's the grape trying to protect itself from a predator. We now know that grape seed is good for breast, colon, and prostate cancer. So if you're eating grapes, red with skin and seed, and if you drink alcohol, red wine would be the best beverage. The guideline number six says limit, or if consumed at all, limit alcohol to two a day for men and one a day for women. And to me, that's very dichotomous. If at all, two a day? I mean, I can't drink two alcoholic beverages a day. That seems like a, a big range. Women at risk for breast cancer, the recommendation is one drink a week. Because breast cancer, linear relationship between the number of glasses of alcohol and the development of estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. But I skipped guideline number five. Some of you might have noticed. Limit consumption of red meat and avoid, which is a very big word, processed meats. So that's salami, bologna, hot dog, bacon, sausage, anything on a pizza, really. <clears throat> now, why is that? Red meat, first of all, the way we feed animals nowadays, they make their fat into fat that's rich in omega-6 fatty acids. You've heard of omega-3 and omega-6, and they've gotten sort of a good, good guy, bad guy reputation. Omega-6, when you cut yourself, you want your platelets to clot, and you want to get red, hot, tender, and swollen. That's inflammation. We need that to heal and to clot. Anti-inflammatory omega-3 breaks up clots of platelet and is against inflammation. So we like anti-inflammatory, but we need some omega-6. Our diet used to have a ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 of 2 to 1, and now it's 18 to 1 because of how we feed animals and because we use cheap oils in cooking. So most red meat, because we feed it grains that they don't know how to utilize instead of grass, which they do, uh, is too rich in omega-6 fatty acids. But red meat also has nitrites, or processed meats has nitrites, and we love to barbecue in this country. Burnt flesh creates heterocyclic amines, which cause cancer. And red meat also is a source of iron. I know the chemotherapy nurses tell you eat more red meat when you become anemic. If you're not anemic from iron deficiency, iron fuels cancer growth. So that's not a good idea. So the, that's the bad stuff about red meat. So what animals should we eat? Deep cold water fish, salmon, black cod, albacore tuna, herring, mackerel, and sardine. They're all rich in omega-3s. Other fish and seafood are fine too, but those are the richest ones in omega-3. And since people aren't going to eat those every day, I recommend taking an omega-3 supplement. Poultry, chicken and eggs are the most inflammation-promoting foods out there. Chicken and eggs, not only because of what we feed them, but because they're rich in arachnidonic acid, which is the chemical precursors to prostaglandins, the chemical mediators of inflammation. I eat poultry, but it needs to be organic. If you're eating eggs, they need to be organic omega-3 eggs. Another animal product I'm not crazy about is dairy. There's no other animal that drinks another species' milk. But no other animal drives a car or goes to college, so that's not a very good argument. 
but no animal drinks milk after they've been weaned. And by the age of three or four, we lose the ability to digest the sugars and the proteins in dairy. We make a big deal about fat, low fat, no fat, 2%. It's not the fat. If you want dairy, butter is probably a good dairy product because it's mainly fat. We talk about lactose intolerance as if it's a disease or a disorder, when in fact it's the norm. And the ability to digest dairy is a genetic mutation on the second chromosome found mainly in Scandinavians who needed to digest reindeer milk in times of freeze. Otherwise, the rest of us, especially Asians, are lactose intolerant and don't know until we stop. So people always say, well, what about yogurt? Yogurt or kefir, the sugars and the proteins have been altered by the bacteria. So if you must have a dairy product, butter or yogurt or kefir, as long as they're not artificially colored, artificially flavored, or with added sugar. Now, when I see patients in clinic, I always bring out two bars, those energy bars, and I compare uh, the ingredients list. Now, when I say no sugar, it's okay to have sugars in the nutrition facts box. Where I don't want to see sugar and a nickname for sugar is in the ingredients list. So one of my bars has 13 grams of sugar, and the first ingredient is brown rice syrup, which is, the second ingredient is that famous soy protein isolate, whatever that is. The third ingredient is uh, crystal, or fructose crystals, and the fourth ingredient is, is crystalline fructose. So they're sort of the same thing, but the words are reversed. The other bar has 15 grams of sugar in the nutrition facts box, but the ingredients are dates, almonds, cashews, and sea salt. Four ingredients, whereas the other one has four lines of ingredients, and they're all natural, and the sugar is in the date attached to the fiber and not artificial sugar. I forgot to say salad. I need to tell you something about salad. A lot of patients say, I eat a lot of vegetables, I eat salad. I don't think salad is a very potent food. It's mainly lettuce, cucumber, and celery. Those are all basically water with a little vitamin C, but not the potent nutrients in other foods. And worse, people tend to slice white button mushrooms and throw them in a salad raw. All mushrooms need to be cooked. White button mushrooms contain a cancer-causing compound. So white buttons, their brown cousins of crimini and their giant cousins of portobello, all must be cooked. Those mushrooms are the agaricus species, and they have some aromatase inhibitor activity, so okay for women with breast cancer. But all mushrooms need to be cooked. Better mushrooms are the Asian shiitake, maitake, and enoki, because they have some immune enhancing and perhaps some anti-cancer activity. And then I like my patients to take some medicinal mushroom capsules of mushrooms that are not edible, again, because they have immune enhancing and anti-cancer activity. So that's pretty much what I need to say about food. And since I started talking about medicinal mushroom capsules, I'll move on to what I like to think about supplements. So I mentioned fish oil. And again, I think people should take a fish oil. Uh, the concern that many of my oncology colleagues have is fish oil makes you bleed. Well, only if you take more than four grams a day, and most people I don't think need that much. People don't like fish oil sometimes. I take a capsule, not the liquid, because the taste is not for me. Keep it in the refrigerator, and then take it in the morning and eat food on top of it, and that decreases fishy burps if you refrigerate it and eat on top of it. Vitamin D we get from the sunshine. And... My colleagues in dermatology have made all of us so fearful of the sun that we cover ourselves up, we don't go out, or we put on a lot of SPF stuff so that we don't absorb any vitamin D. And then there are those of us who are over 50 where our skin doesn't make it anymore so much from the sunshine, or those of us who are obese or dark skin. So we have an epidemic of vitamin D deficiency in the world today. And Low vitamin D leads to an increased risk of cancer, a number of different kinds. And people with cancer whose vitamin D levels are low don't do as well 
as people whose vitamin D levels are normal. So I like to measure people's 25-hydroxy vitamin D. And I like to get them to a level of 40 to 50 nanograms per milliliter. So each 1,000 units of vitamin D should raise you 10 nanograms. So if your blood test comes back 25, I'd like you to be 45, so you need 2,000 international units. Many people take vitamin D complex with calcium. Vitamin D is fat soluble, so it shouldn't be taken as a white powder as in a pill or a capsule. It should be a gel bead or a liquid. Take your calcium with magnesium separately. I think all of us over 50, especially if we cut down on dairy, the major source of calcium in our diet, need to take a little bit of a calcium supplement. Calcium reduces the risk of colon cancer, but it may increase the risk of prostate cancer. Personally, I think it's the dairy that increases the risk of prostate cancer and not the calcium per se, but that's a little equivocal. So I don't take too much calcium, but a little calcium magnesium. So I like omega-3s, calcium magnesium, and vitamin D. Then I usually recommend uh, mushrooms, medicinal mushroom blend. Turmeric, again, can be taken as a capsule, depending on, you know, I like it for people who have gastrointestinal malignancies or people who have pain because I think turmeric is a good anti-inflammatory. There are some other, you know, I, patients come to me, you know, I saw a guy yesterday, he takes 80 pills a day of supplements. No, eat food, you know, it's a, little, a little too much. So, you know, I, I don't really believe in too many uh, supplements. Again, depending on certain conditions, maybe I'm going to recommend something else, but not that many. Stress. I ask patients to tell me the story when they first come to see me. And a lot of people weave a story as if stress caused their cancer. Stress in and of itself is not going to cause cancer. But stress is adrenaline or epinephrine, which kills your lymphocytes, the building block cells of your immune system. And stress is cortisol, which is a steroid hormone, which is an immune suppression. So they've done studies in mice with breast cancer where one group runs free and another group is stressed. That is, they're confined. And they find at the end of the study that the confined or the stress mice have the same size primary cancer but increased size and number of metastases. So stress is not good for cancer. So how do we reduce stress? Many people exercise. I like massage. I find I'm pretty relaxed after a massage. There's some old wives tale that people with cancer shouldn't get a massage because it'll spread their cancer. No, I don't think so. Now, today I saw a patient getting chemotherapy for breast cancer who told me that she went to a lovely spa and told the masseur that she was getting chemotherapy and he put gloves on because he didn't want to get the chemotherapy. And she asked me if that was, I don't know. I don't know if we've ever measured sweat to see if it has chemotherapy in it. But she said she wound up having a good massage, but she felt a little bit, you know, like a leper. I think that would increase her stress, yeah. We're very big on the breath. That's why for me yoga is a good thing to do because breathing is something that we do without thinking about it, but we can also think about it and control it. So uh, usually it's autonomic, but you can control the pace and the depth of your inspiration and expiration, and that is the link between the mind and the body. And so there are just many breathing exercises, just slowing down and filling your lungs down to your abdomen with breath and inhaling good and exhaling bad. You know, there are all these things that are little, the basis of hypnosis and yoga and meditation. So just becoming aware of your breath. And we at Osher do those mindfulness-based stress reduction, the eight-week course which many people find uh, very useful. It's one of the only things, when you say I walk the walk, it's one of the only things I haven't done yet is an eight-week course because I travel so much. I don't know how I would work that into my life. But uh, meditation, uh, I like guided imagery. 
CD-ROMs, you listen, and they take you on a nice journey in your mind to a beach in Maui, and you think about your lymphocytes eating up your cancer cells. So I usually give patients a, a guided imagery catalog and point out some. There's, there's a good one that I bought and I listened to on uh, caregiver stress uh, that I recommend to people. My problem is uh, I don't have time to listen all the time, so I put it in my car and I drive listening to guided image. Not a good idea, no, because, you know, you get very mellow and you're not paying attention. It's not a good thing, so, so stress. Uh, Chinese medicine. Traditional Chinese medicine is all about expelling evil and supporting good. Modern Western medicine really focuses, as you all know, on expelling evil. People that come to see me, I'm trying to support good. But when you go to a traditional Chinese medicine practitioner, they do both at the same time, but from a different angle. So they won't say you have stage 2A colon cancer or stage 3B lung cancer. They're going to say you have decreased spleen chi and increased kidney yang, and they'll treat that. And I think for many people, using all the tools in the toolbox is a good thing. Personally, in my experience at the Osher Center for the last 12 years, patients undergoing chemo, radiation, hormonal therapy who get acupuncture seem to have a much easier time than patients who don't. Acupuncture is all about changing flow of your energy, your chi. The National Institutes of Health in 1997 concluded that acupuncture was good for chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting. Now we know it's also good for preventing dry mouth in patients who get radiation to the head and neck. I think it's good for hot flashes for men and women who are having hormonal manipulation. I think it's good for neuropathy. I think it's good for fatigue. I really think that you know acupuncture and Chinese medicine is really important. So I try to get all of the patients I'm seeing who are actively undergoing treatment for their cancer uh, to see one of our acupuncturists who are often very booked in advance, so there are acupuncturists out there who also are, are good in the world. Speaking of nausea and vomiting, I, I did gloss over cannabis, didn't I? I forgot to say anything about it. So I've been doing research in medical cannabis for 20 years now, and I think it's incredibly useful medicine. Uh, even not doing research, Patients who tell me that cannabis is useful for their chemotherapy-induced nausea have been telling me this for 30 years. I say I need a clinical trial to show me that cannabis is useful for chemotherapy-induced nausea like I need a clinical trial to show me penicillin is an antibiotic. It works. And many of the anti-nausea medicines, or particularly the most popular one, causes constipation. And patients don't like being constipated. Cannabis does not cause constipation. Cannabis is the only anti-nausea medicine that also increases appetite. It also lets people sleep. It's good for pain, maybe neuropathy pain, maybe boost the benefit of opiates. We've done that clinical trial that suggested that that might be the case. Uh, helps people sleep. I mean, I can tell patients one drug for five different symptoms instead of prescribing five different medicines that all might interact with each other or the chemotherapy that I'm giving. So I'm a big fan of cannabis for symptom management. What about anti-cancer? Who said that cannabis cures cancer? This for me is the most disturbing thing that I deal with. Patients who wait three to six months to see me in clinic and who have been treating a potentially curable cancer with CBD oil or THC CBD because they saw on the internet that this cures cancer and now they have metastatic disease and they're not going to be cured. In 1975, somebody at the National Cancer Institute, actually my first boss when I was a fellow, Michael Friedman was one of the authors of this article that showed that in the test tube, Delta 9 THC, the most psychoactive ingredient in cannabis, CBD, cannabidiol, a non-psychoactive cannabinoid that people use for pain and inflammation, and delta-8 THC all inhibited cancer cells in the test tube. And then they transplanted cancer into mice and cannabis. These cannabinoids, the active ingredient, seemed to 
suppress the cancer in the mice. Test tube in mice to people is a huge jump. Now, there are people out there that say they've cured their cancer, and some of them are my patients, and they forget that they got chemotherapy too. <laughs> Amnesia, selective. So, I mean, the number of emails I get from across the world every day, how much CBD to THC ratio? What, I mean, there's no answer to this question. Last night I had dinner with my rabbi. I said, Rabbi, how do you answer a question that doesn't have an answer? Because I figure a rabbi must get a lot of those questions. I don't know what to do. I mean, I get angry because there's no answer to this question and people ask me as if I should know. And when I don't, you know, so I just delete, delete, delete. I don't answer these. I'm sorry if you've sent me that question. I can't answer the question. I do ask three hard questions myself at the end of my interview with my patients. First, I say, these aren't the hard ones. I say, were you raised with any religious beliefs currently? Do you consider yourself spiritual? Those are the easy ones. Then my three hard ones are, what brings you joy? What are your hopes? And where does your strength come from? Those are hard because people have, you know, just running down the hallway have asked me, one of those three, and I don't, you know, I don't know, I don't know. But the reason I asked the question, and I, I ran into a woman at a conference who told me that her husband who died, his life changed when I asked him those questions. Because he realized that he still, even though he was battling cancer and he was pre-terminal, that he still had joy and hope and strength. And I asked people to remember that and incorporate that into your journey and moving forward. So that's what I do, and I love it, and I, I think I help people. How do I know? When I first started 12 years ago, most patients found me on Andy Weil's website and came that way. And now my colleagues at the Cancer Center hear how long their patients have to wait to see me, and they call me and say, can't you squeeze this person in? Well, I do a one-hour new patient appointment, and I have a four-hour clinic, so where do you squeeze in another hour? That's sort of difficult. So I wind up having to add on another clinic. And so they keep me very busy, and that suggests that because I haven't done a clinical trial that what I do works, but the fact that my colleagues are keeping me very busy suggests to me that they might appreciate, just as I appreciate that my patients do better when they're seen by our Chinese medicine practitioners, maybe they appreciate that their patients do better when they incorporate some of the guidance and teachings that I've given them uh, through our consultation. So again, if I haven't seen you, the wait is long. So you've just heard uh, what I have to say. This book uh, that Naomi mentioned is written for healthcare providers. It is a textbook and it is very heavy, uh, but many of my patients do enjoy it. On my Osher Center website, at the bottom, there are four uh, videos that I did. One is an introduction uh, to integrative oncology. One is nutrition, one is supplements, and one is cannabis. So sort of an more extended version maybe of what I've discussed tonight, but maybe what I've discussed tonight is just uh, as uh, intense as what's there. So I, I probably left out a, a lot of things that you want to hear about, and so I'd like to uh, thank you for your attention and open the session for questions and ask that you please use the microphone because I am a little deaf. So thank you. You, I can probably hear in the front row, yeah. <clears throat> I'd like to ask two questions. One is, do you do genetic testing of biopsies as a part of your analysis in going forward? So, no, I don't treat the cancer. That's for the doctors that are treating the cancer. They would do that. I don't do that. I treat the soil and make the garden as inhospitable as possible to growth and spread of the cancer, which is the weed. So your primary oncologist should do that when it's available. It's not something I do from the Osher Center because I don't have access to the cancer. Uh, 
do you, do you have any experience with using your methodology without the drone approach as an associate to it? When I say drone, I mean uh, hormones and, and surgery and um, radiation. I mean, that's your partner, I guess. Or right. So what I practice is integrative oncology. So I integrate complementary therapies with conventional care. Yeah. I don't recommend my treatments as alternatives to what you might be calling the drone approach. <coughs> that correctly. Do, do you work with any situation uh, or with doctors that uh, dismiss the drone approach, which seems to be standard? Uh, Ma'am, I'm an oncologist. I've been an oncologist, UCSF trained for 36 years. I'm an oncologist. It works. We cure people. Thank you. Next question. Um, do all cancers behave, uh, all the information that you've given us, is it general enough to all cancers or are there some cancers that maybe don't play by the same rules? Yeah. And specifically, in my case, multiple myeloma. Yeah, we're not talking about specific cases, but since you mentioned it, the lymphoproliferative disorders, which I consider to be uh, lymphoma and myeloma, I often don't recommend people do medicinal mushrooms because they're immune enhancing and those are malignancies that are, the immune system is already enhanced. But for the most part, I'm not treating the weed, I'm treating the garden. And for the most part, you know, it's pretty similar. I mean, men with prostate cancer, I might rely a little bit heavier on tomatoes. Lycopene, the active ingredient in tomatoes, needs to be oil extracted. I also like pomegranate, but not pomegranate juice. There's a recommendation that men with prostate cancer drink eight ounces of pomegranate juice a day. That's too much sugar. So I, that's where I say take the pomegranate capsule. So, you know, there are slightly different tweaks that I do for different things. Lung cancer, I like astragalus. Uh, in uh, studies in China, uh, people who are getting chemotherapy who also got astragalus did better. So I might recommend astragalus for somebody with lung cancer getting chemotherapy. But yeah, for the myelomas, lymphomas, Hodgkin's, uh, I'm not a big fan of medicinal mushrooms. Some of my patients take them anyway and they seem to be doing okay. The, the problem with a lot of this that your oncologist will be the first to point out, lack of evidence because nobody's done these clinical trials. Oncologists, and I'm an oncologist, are the most evidence demanding of medicine subspecialties. Why? Because we deal with a very serious illness and we use very potent medicine. So I'm not gonna say, oh, here, take this chemotherapy. It's gonna make your hair fall out, you're gonna vomit, and your bone marrow is gonna be suppressed without having evidence that it works. But if I say, eat more broccoli or tomato sauce, you know, how much harm is that gonna do? Andrew Weil always says the degree of evidence should be directly proportional to the potential for the intervention to do harm. Thank you. So we don't have a lot of evidence for much of what I do. Yes, sir. Um, I have a couple of questions. First of all, um, I've been getting acupuncture treatment for my um, cancer, and I, um, the acupuncturists invariably give us um, Chinese herbs. And I have no idea what the herbs are that they're giving me or how effective they are. Is there any source of information that we can, what, what do you suggest? Well, you can, ask, you can ask your acupuncturist what these herbs are. And, you know, I, when patients come to me with herbs like that, I ask my acupuncturist, you know, what are these and are they okay? And, you know, that's why I would go to an acupuncturist who has some uh, experience working with people living with cancer. We actually did a survey of Northern California acupuncturists and got about 500 to respond to a, a survey. And we asked about their training and about what they felt that they were doing because cancer is not really a Chinese medicine diagnosis. So most of the acupuncturists did not think that what they were doing was gonna impact on the cancer per se, but on the patient and their quality of life. The, the, most significant, the most significant finding of our study, which we now have submitted for publication, 95% of the acupuncturists never were contacted by the oncologist 
and 95% of the acupuncturists never contacted the oncologist. So there's a lack of communication that's important. Oncologists are really phobic about Chinese herbs. In fact, I just had a patient Chinese patient at San Francisco General. I gave him his first cycle of chemo, admitted to the hospital with fever and zero white blood cells. And the first thing I said, were you taking any herbs? Because very unusual. So the reasons that, that oncologists get nervous about supplements and particularly herbs are twofold. Number one, usually they're both broken down by the same pathway in the liver. So if you take something that blocks that pathway, the chemotherapy is not going to be broken down and it's going to build up to a higher level and be more toxic. If, on the other hand, you take something, an herb or a supplement that makes those enzymes work faster, it's going to decrease the level of the chemotherapy in the bloodstream and make it less active. And then the other thing that we worry about is antioxidants. Radiation therapy works by making those free radicals of oxygen. That's what bumps into the DNA of the cancer cells and kills it. Some chemotherapy works also by making those free radicals. So if you're taking an antioxidant, either a supplement of vitamin A, C, or E, for example, when you're getting radiation or chemo that works that way, you're diminishing the potential effect of the radiation and chemo. So that's why it's important to know a little bit about what these herbs are. I, I have gotten the names of the herbs. I, I don't remember them offhand, but um, there's nothing available in any information. I ask them if where Again. can I get some information about these. And some of them say, well, you know, they kind of shrug their shoulders. And I mean, information to an oncologist means you've done a study where this half of the room got the herbs and this half of the room got placebo herbs, and then we look and see what happens. There's just, it's the same as CBD, THC. There's no information, so there's no way to answer the question. My, uh, my uh, last question, sir, is um, are you aware of turkey tail m mushroom? And yeah, can you that's my uh, favorite. Yeah. Comment on that. Turkey tail. Coriolis versicolor, now called Trimedes versicolor, is, is the mushroom that I, it's been studied in Japan and China particularly uh, for use in conjunction with chemo and radiation in patients getting uh, treated for gastric and colon cancer, and they're studying it at Bastyr for breast cancer. And again, in the absence of data, I think it's a safe intervention, and I have most of the patients I see taking turkey tail mushrooms uh, for cancer. <coughs> Sorry, you've already asked questions, dear. Yeah. Um, with turkey tail, do you do NK cell testing before? Do you think it's useful for monitoring? No, I you don't. just give everybody the turkey tail. Yeah. Yeah. Turkey tail boosts natural killer cell activity. She's asking me if I do NK. That's expensive and it's not uh, CLIA certified, I don't think. It's not a standard laboratory test, so there's no way I could do that. Okay, you got it? So, so, Doctor, you mentioned that there's a disconnect in terms of communication between um, com complementary medicine practitioners and oncologists, right? Acupuncture is not talking to oncologists. Yeah. So what steps can I take in terms of bridging that gap or increasing that communication? Oncologists are, like, really busy. <laughs> it's so hard to get a hold of What steps should you take in what capacity? Are bridging you? that gap. Are you an acupuncturist? Or a I'm not. I'm actually a caregiver. You're what? I'm a caregiver for my mom. Uh huh. You can ask your oncologist or your acupuncturist if they've spoken to each other. We at the Osher Center now have an electronic medical record. So when I see a patient that's been seen by my acupuncturist, I just send the uh, chart note to the acupuncturist and vice versa. And then we also pass each other in the hallway and talk about our patients too. So right. I think we're a little more integrated to an extent. Because even the chemo teach that we went to, I think it would have been helpful to, to get some information about, like, if you're taking this supplement, you know, it might inhibit uh, the benefits of the chemotherapy. Uh, so those kinds of things are really helpful to hear. It's, it's, you know. Yeah, it's a problem. I must say, uh, God bless the chemotherapy nurses, mm -hmm. but uh, I had a meeting with the breast group because everything I tell patients to do, they tell them not to, and then everything they tell patients to do, I say, no, don't do that. Right. So we need to sort of be on the same page. It's the problem. Yeah. Thank you.
Um, I have two short questions. One is, what do you think about calorie restriction during treatment? I've read about ketogenic diets. Do they uh -huh. help? And the second is, the general um, idea about sugar, is it bad because of what you explained about insulin system? Or, Yeah, thank well, you. I mean, to, be, to answer that uh, first, the second question first, I always say, because my colleagues at the cancer center often say, why do you tell all of our patients that cancer loves sugar? I say, what's a PET scan? I don't know if anybody's had a PET CT scan. That's how we stage or look for cancer now. We inject people with radio-labeled sugar. And where does it go? To the cancer. Because cancer does not use oxygen for energy. It uses sugar. So that's the answer there. What, I forget now what the first question was. Uh, the first one was calorie restriction oh, during yeah. treatments yeah. like radiation or yeah. chemo. So actually, there's a new faculty member for the GU oncology or somebody coming uh, to uh, look at a new position who's giving a lecture on that next Wednesday, or maybe it was yesterday. I don't, uh, it seems to be very popular in Southern California. And I know a lot of people who are suggesting that patients fast before they get chemotherapy because somehow that makes the chemotherapy more effective. I've been an oncologist for 35 years now. I've cured people with cancer who didn't fast before their chemotherapy. I think I've never had chemotherapy, but I think getting chemotherapy in and of itself would be enough of a stressor that I can't picture making people fast to get their chemotherapy. Maybe I'll be proven wrong, but again, we've been able to cure a lot of cancers without people needing to fast. Yes, question Hi. over here? I have the mic. Oh, okay. Hi. <laughs> Stole it. Um, medical cannabis, what format do you take it in? Do you smoke it? Do you eat it? And then how do you actually get it? Can your oncologist prescribe it to you? No, nobody can prescribe cannabis. It's a Schedule One substance. I can because I have a Schedule One license only in research subjects. So what we do for the last 20 years in California, the, your oncologist can write a letter saying, I'm taking care of this patient. Uh, I think they, I will continue to follow them if they choose to use medical cannabis for this reason. And I have a lot of tick boxes that I check off. And then the patient takes that to the dispensary. The dispensary calls the oncologist, says, did you write this letter? And once they say yes, then the patient can access cannabis at the dispensary. Now, a lot of people come and say, my oncologist won't write that letter because they have federal grants. I say, well, that's the, you know what I'm saying, because I have federal grants to study cannabis, and I've been writing these recommendation letters for 20 years. So very good question. How do I recommend that people use cannabis? When cannabis is inhaled, either smoked or vaporized, the peak plasma concentration of the Delta-9 THC, the psychoactive component, is reached in two and a half minutes, and then it dissipates quite quickly. When it's taken by mouth, it takes two and a half hours, and the half-life is 25 hours. And when taken by mouth, when it passes through the liver, the delta-9 THC, which is psychoactive, gets metabolized into another psychoactive compound. So people who take it by mouth get more zonked than people who inhale it. So I see a lot of older women who have not tried cannabis who feel that eating is good and smoking is bad. So they go to the dispensary and they buy a cookie, which I'm not particularly in favor of because cookies are usually dairy and sugar. And they're told only eat a quarter of the cookie. And they eat it and nothing happens, right? So they eat another quarter and nothing happens. So they eat the whole cookie and call me three days later after they've been in the emergency room saying, I'm never going to do that again. So I say, if you need to have more control over the onset, the depth, and the duration of the effect, I prefer inhalation. But if you need to have a more sustained effect, then taking it by mouth is probably an okay way to go if you know what your dose is and what you're taking. You, you talked about how processed foods are not, not good. Uh, what, you I'm sorry. talked about processed foods not being good for you. Increasingly, there are processed foods that I see that say they have no nitrates, no nitrites. Do they fall in the same category? I'm not sure what exactly, you know, the processed foods. Oh, is I see sausage, like sausage, says no nitrites, no preservatives. Would they be in the same category as? Yeah, that's a, that's a, what are the, what are the uh, processed meat? Yeah, that's a processed meat. Yeah, 
I mean, because you don't know what's in it altogether, even though it doesn't have nitrites. Nitrites are the biggest carcinogen, but I would stay away from it. I mean, you know, again, I tell my patients because a lot of my patients come to see me the second or third visit and they have a little Donald sitting on their shoulder every time they eat something. And I'm not a, I'm not a priest. Uh, we're not doing confession here. I'm saying if you go out and you eat something, you're not going to drop dead, you know, eating a piece of cake for your birthday. You know, moderation. I wouldn't eat processed meat every day. My question does yeah. anybody taking um, decaffeinated green tea, would that be getting the same benefit as the uh, regular organic green tea? This is a very excellent question, and I think uh, the answer might be that decaffeination, the process of decaffeination, might remove some of the polyphenols that you're trying to get. So what I tell people, if you're using a tea bag, Put the tea bag in your teacup, brew it for two minutes, throw out that tea, and then rebrew because the caffeine usually comes out in the first two minutes. So Thank you, you can decaffeinate your own tea that way. I got confused when you said something about the absorption if you're taking it in the capsule with the pepper line, and I got confused wondering should that not be taken during chemotherapy? Well, I think if it will, it could increase. If it increases, the, if the chemotherapy is oral, no because it will increase the absorption of the chemotherapy, making it potentially more toxic. If it's intravenous, it's not going to do that. And it's but okay. it will increase the absorption of any of the oral anti-emetics, the anti-nausea medicines, and that could be problematic if it has black pepper. There are also more absorbable forms of turmeric that are not processed with black pepper. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yes. Are you in favor of multivitamin pills? You said so many vitamins we don't know sometimes which ones are. Yeah, am I in favor of multivitamins? No, not if you eat well. I don't think you need them. And why do I say that? Especially those fat soluble vitamins, A and E, are toxic and may be detrimental. I mean, there was a study in smokers of beta carotene, which is a vitamin A that showed that beta carotene actually increased the risk of lung cancer. They looked in that study at beta carotene and vitamin E, and there was a suggestion that vitamin E decreased the risk of prostate cancer. So they did a larger study looking at vitamin E and selenium. Does that decrease the risk of prostate cancer? Well, lo and behold, vitamin E increased the risk of prostate cancer. And then there's B vitamins, which everybody says, well, gee, they're benign. They're water soluble. If you take too many B vitamins, you just pee them out. In Norway, they don't fortify baked goods with B vitamins like we do here to prevent babies from being born with neural tube defects. So they did a study in elderly Norwegians with heart disease to see if B vitamins would decrease heart disease. One group got vitamin B12 and folic acid. One group got B6. One group got B6, B12, and folic acid, and one group got placebo. The study went on for three years, and there were 2,000 people in each group. At the end of three years, the patients getting folic acid and B12 had more cancer, more death from cancer, and more all-cause mortality. And I think the bad actor here is folic acid. Folate is natural, comes from foliage, green leafy vegetables. Folic acid is synthetic, and I think the reason we continue to have colon cancer despite screening colonoscopy is because folic acid allows adenomatous growths to become adenocarcinomas. And there was a study showing folic acid increases the risk of prostate cancer in men. So that particular B vitamin is okay for people taking the chemotherapy pemetrexid because you need that folic acid and folic acid has been shown to decrease the risk of breast cancer in women who drink too much alcohol. But otherwise, that's A and E and that B. I don't think people should take a multivitamin if they eat well. In certain situations, if they don't absorb, they might need to have a multivitamin. But if you are vegetarian or... Well, vegetarian or vegan, particularly, vegans do get deficiencies in a number of vitamins, particularly B12, which is important, yeah. People should get B12 supplementation. Okay, we're not talking about yeah. Oh, okay. I, um, 
<laughs> yes. I don't know if I need this, but uh, I had a question again um, about the uh, for people who are. Is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> One of my colleagues. Oh, medical <laughs> cannabis. Yeah. So, and and why I'm asking is I have patients who are smoking it. They they have respiratory disease. I've been trying to convince them not to do that, but. Um, what it's I'm an anti-inflammatory and an antioxidant. It decreases the risk of COPD in patients who smoke tobacco and cannabis and decreases the risk of lung cancer. And it's probably a bronchodilator. So. Wow. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. You know. So I can just leave that alone then? I don't have to, I, I don't have to fight that battle? Maybe. You should, yeah. I'll leave that alone. Yeah, I think so. I'm going to bombard oh, right wait, here. Wait, just one more question though about the inhaling it. Is there a method of inhaling it that would be less, I, I don't know. Well, I, we did a study looking at a vaporizer, a volcano vaporizer it was called, and that uh, delivered the same amount of THC and got people equally as high uh, with less expired carbon monoxide than smoking. Our expired carbon monoxide is a marker for right. exposure to noxious gases. So I like vaporization. Very good. You got the microphone. Right here. Oh. Yeah, thank you so much. You gave a lot of information and uh, more than probably I will be able to process <laughs> right away. You but can watch the videos. Yeah. I, um, the one thing for sure, though, is that you were mentioning uh, with obesity and... Um, I can appreciate what you're saying in terms of what things that I, I will need to change personally, uh, anyone else as a group of people or whatever. So there was one area with the side effects of some things with the green tea versus white tea. Um, can you address that? Side effects? Of green tea. I, you know, with when you had some side effects from the chemo and radiation, and then you were told not to do the green tea. But white teas, what do you uh, have to say about white tea? So tea is really the name of the beverage brewed from the Chinese camellia or the camellia sinensis, and it's graded on how oxidized the leaf is before the beverage is brewed. White, green, oolong, black, and poo air. And the two that have the cancer-fighting chemicals are white and green. So, and I don't think, I don't think of green or white tea as being useful for chemotherapy side effects, but useful for decreasing the risk of cancer. Thus, they're very potent cancer risk-reducing chemicals. Yes. Could you speak a little bit to um, how we cook our vegetables? Most of us don't want to eat raw broccoli. How to, how to cook them. What, oh. I mean, we have to inflict a little bit of heat to make them a little bit palatable. Yeah. So well, I, yeah, I'm we not a that? raw person. I don't think the raw people say, well, if you cook it, you're going to destroy the enzymes. Well, we have our own enzymes. But broccoli and garlic, for example do need to be crushed to become more active. So you can crush them with your, your teeth or, you know, bro uh, garlic. They always say crush it, uh, mince it before you cook with it. Let it sit there and do its chemical reaction after you do that. Uh, uh, broccoli, you do inactivate one of its enzymes if you heat it. So bladder cancer, bladder cancer you has... If you cook it. If you cook it, yeah. Bladder cancer... Is decreased risk in patients who eat raw broccoli, but I don't think you always have to eat raw broccoli. So when I say, tell people how to cook vegetables, uh, steam, blanch, stir fry. N don't cook them the way my mother in Cleveland did so that the broccoli becomes gray brown and not recognizable. Should still have a little crunch and a little color. It doesn't kill all the good things in it. I don't think so. Oh, Last question. Uh, do you feel like massage really helps the immune system and like the lymphatic system to respond better and be healthier? I don't have hard data, but I think so, yeah, because I think it decreases stress. Decreasing stress helps the immune system respond better. Okay. Thank you all for these Thank great questions. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. I know we didn't get to everybody's questions. Maybe we could do another talk at some point. Thank you all for being here. And thank you